this video, uh, we're going to be talking about hemoglobin and the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? If you're expecting any jazzy animations, no, they're not going to be here. This is going to be an in-depth discussion, um, so make yourselves comfortable for the next half an hour or so, okay? Right, so you know um, that the main function of the circulatory system is to transport um, oxygen from the lungs to the heart and then the heart then to all the other tissues. And the main idea being, I mean, you know, this is not really stated very obviously, but in the background of the circulatory system, what's the reason that that circulatory system has to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide primarily is because of this. Cellular respiration. Okay. Cellular respiration that <coughs> That is combining glucose and oxygen, you know, in general terms. It's a bit more complicated than this, but in general terms, we're using up oxygen that we get from the environment. Combining that with glucose we get in general terms from our diet to produce energy which we store during the formation of ATP. And when we need that energy, we break that down. That's not the best way, maybe it's better to do it like this. The energy that we get is used to drive the formation of ATP from ADP, okay? And when we need that energy, we break that ATP back down to ADP and to release that energy and use that energy to drive certain other cellular processes. Okay. But for our purposes, the two things that we're going to be looking at is A, that oxygen is being used up by all our cells because all of our cells are carrying this process out. Some carry this process out more intensely, such as muscle cells, and some other ones, you know, just at a kind of background level. So we're using oxygen up in this process and we are producing carbon dioxide. Okay. So this we need to get from the environment and be able to transport to all the cells that are carrying this process out. And at the same time, we need to transport away this carbon dioxide that is being produced. Okay, back to the lungs so that it can go back into the environment. All right, so in the background of what we're gonna talk about is this process and we need to have it there, but we're not gonna to refer to it directly at any stage. So, the circulatory system is there to transport oxygen to all the tissues, all the cells of all the tissues of the body, and to, at the same time, take away the carbon dioxide that is being produced by all the cells of all the tissues of the body, okay, in this process. Now, what is the thing, the substance that is doing that, the substance is your blood and in particular we're going to be looking at one of the important um, components of the carriage of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood which is the protein hemoglobin okay so you've looked already at the structure of hemoglobin um, but it's right there and just so we can remind ourselves four separate subunits, four separate polypeptide chains. Each polypeptide chain has got, um, each polypeptide chain has got a, a particular primary structure, a chain of amino acids in a particular sequence or order, 
That polypeptide chain is folded into a secondary structure and tertiary structure, and each subunit has a prosthetic group called heme, H-A-E-M, and at the center of that heme, the prosthetic group, is an iron, an iron ion. Okay? So it's got a positive charge. And that, that positive charge is essentially what is forming the attraction with an oxygen molecule. So each iron ion in the center of each of the four heme groups attracts an oxygen molecule. Okay? So because there's four subunits in hemoglobin, making up its quaternary structure, four separate polypeptide chains, each with their own prosthetic heme group, each with an iron ion, each able to bind one oxygen molecule, each hemoglobin molecule, each hemoglobin protein can bind four molecules of oxygen. Okay? And when it does that, when it has four oxygen molecules bound, it is referred to as oxy oxyhemoglobin okay oxyhemoglobin <clears throat> okay now let's look at what the function of hemoglobin is function is to bind oxygen at the lungs but not only to bind oxygen, because when it gets to the tissues, it actually has to dissociate from that oxygen. It has to separate from those bound oxygens, because there's not going to be much point in hemoglobin being remained bound to oxygen when it needs to release that oxygen to the respiring cells, okay, respiring tissues. So, Hemoglobin has to perform two functions. First, to bind oxygen and transport it to the tissues, but secondly, it also has to be able to dissociate from that oxygen, or the oxygen has to dissociate from it. Okay? Now let's look at why hemoglobin is very good at performing this function compared to, um, or, or, or why blood is very good at performing this function compared to another liquid such as water. Okay? Now, let's just look at a kind of simple example of, of an experiment that we could do, kind of like a thought experiment. Let's say that we were increasing the oxygen concentration above a basin of water. Okay? Above a basin of water. Now, one other key point. When you're talking about the concentration of gases, um, we refer to that as partial pressure, abbreviated to PP, partial pressure, and it's measured in the units of kilopascals. Okay, so the unit is pascals, measured in kilopascals, like, you know, meters, kilometers, etc. Okay, so partial pressure, so it's effectively it's the same thing as concentration, because we're, as we're going to be talking about the movement of gas molecules, we're essentially, we're discussing the proper, you know, the, the process of diffusion that comes into it. So, you know that gases diffuse um, from a region, or gases, gas particles move from a region of their high concentration to a region of their low concentration. And, you know, when we are talking about gases, we refer to their concentration as partial pressure. Okay? Now, as we increase the pressure of oxygen above this liquid, more of it is going to be diffusing into the liquid because effectively we are increasing its concentration and it's more likely then to diffuse into the liquid. So at low partial pressures of oxygen, there'll be a little bit of O2 
dissolved in the water. But as we increase that pressure, there will be more oxygen in the water. As we increase the oxygen partial pressure even more, there will be more oxygen dissolved. And as we increase that oxygen partial pressure even more, there will be even more in the water. Okay? So what that gives us is a kind of you know, direct proportional relationship. The, more, the higher the partial pressure, the more oxygen diffuses into the water, and the more oxygen the water is carrying. Okay, so, so water in itself could be a good transport medium, okay, and it's probably not a coincidence that the blood is primarily um, water, yeah? But, let's think about it this way. What adaptation could an organism develop that makes its transport system even better, all right? Now, Let's look at if this substance was now blood, okay? How does our graph look different if we repeat the same experiment, we increase our partial pressure of oxygen, and see how much oxygen how much oxygen is being bound by the hemoglobin in the blood? How does, what does that relationship look like? That relationship looks like this. So at low, at low partial pressures of, of oxygen, blood actually carries very little oxygen. Okay? It's got very low oxygen saturation. But as the partial pressure of oxygen increases, its saturation increases very steeply. Okay, so as we increase the pressure of oxygen, the binding of oxygen in the blood to the hemoglobin in the blood increases a, a lot, okay, increases a lot. And as we get to very high partial pressures of oxygen, the binding levels off because, you know, obviously there's not an infinite number of hemoglobin molecules, but you're going to reach a point where it's going to reach the 100% level. Okay, and it gets harder and harder to saturate that. Okay, so let's just look at our two curves then. Remember, this is water. Okay, the dotted line. Actually, maybe I should make it key, technically. Okay. That's water, and that's hemoglobin, which we will abbreviate to Hb. Okay? Now, let's look at which one of these would, you know, perform a better function as a, as a carrier of oxygen, okay? So we're looking at percent oxygen saturation, and we're comparing a simple liquid like water, which can dissolve oxygen, to something a bit more adapted, a bit more specialised, like blood that contains the red blood cells which contain the haemoglobin. Now, let's look at where there is a high partial pressure of oxygen. If you think about the parts of the body that will have a high partial pressure of oxygen, we're thinking of the lungs. This is where the blood collects the oxygen, and at high partial pressures, okay, we're, we're looking at this region here, where there's lots of oxygen, high partial pressure of oxygen right there. Okay, so, what we have here now is um, a comparison of what um, the binding curve of um, oxygen looks like, or, or the oxygen saturation of blood looks like, compared to the oxygen saturation of water in a hypothetical experiment as we increase the um, concentration or partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. Now what we're going to do is, is look at, um, in two different situations, which one of these, the blood or the water, performs better as an oxygen carrier? Which one of them has, has got the, the binding properties which are best suited to perform the two functions of an oxygen carrier, i.e. 
being able to bind lots of oxygen when oxygen partial pressure is high, i.e. at the lungs, and which one binds less oxygen when partial pressures of oxygen are low, i.e. in the tissues, because remember, at the lungs, your transport medium has to collect lots of oxygen from the lungs, okay, as much as it can. But when it gets to the tissues, it has to be able to dissociate from that oxygen. It has to, and the better it does that, when the partial pressure of oxygen is low, i.e. wherever the tissues are using up lots of, lots of oxygen and there's not a lot of oxygen, in that situation, your transport medium has to dissociate from the oxygen to provide that oxygen to the cells that need it, okay? That is what a good oxygen transport medium should do. Now let's see which one does it better, the hemoglobin or the water, right? Now, let's look. So what's happening at the lungs? Now at the lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen is very high, yeah? Lots of oxygen coming in from the environment, uh, sorry, from the atmosphere into the lungs, high concentration of oxygen coming into the capillaries by diffusion, high partial pressure, okay, of oxygen there. And at that point, because of the nature of binding of oxygen to hemoglobin compared to water, it binds much more compared to water. Look, at the same partial pressure, hemoglobin has got a much higher binding capacity of oxygen compared to water in our hypothetical experiment. Now, let's compare then, when this blood then gets to the tissues where there's not a lot of oxygen around because it's constantly being used up by the cells, i.e. the partial pressure of oxygen is very low, let's look at what's happening at that, in that situation. In that situation, hemoglobin binds less oxygen than water, okay? So binds less oxygen, i.e. it's good at dissociating from oxygen when the partial pressure of oxygen is very low, which is exactly what you need it to do, okay? So, let's just make that comparison as well, okay? So, the binding properties of oxygen and hemoglobin are ideal for its for hemoglobin's role as an oxygen transporter. When partial pressures of oxygen are high, it's got a high um, saturation of oxygen, high percentage saturation of oxygen. But as the blood moves away from the lungs and gets into the tissues where the partial pressures of oxygen are low, that's when the curve falls very steeply, and that means it's dissociating um, more from the oxygen, so the dissociation of oxygen is high, i.e. that now that bound oxygen is available to the tissues to, that now that oxygen is available to the tissues, i.e. the oxygen can diffuse into the tissues because it's no longer bound to the haemoglobin. And that's exactly what you want it to do. Okay? So that's the description of the binding of haemoglobin and oxygen and how that um, binding is ideally um, suited for um, hemoglobin's role as an oxygen transporter, okay? Because remember, it has to bind oxygen and dissociate from it, all right? So what we're gonna do next is talk about why the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin shows this kind of S-shaped curve, okay? And that's related to its uh, the structure of the protein itself, so that will be the topic when I come back. Right guys, um, we're now going to talk, going to talk about um, why is it that the binding of oxygen to haemoglobin shows an S-shaped curve? Surely, if we have four subunits of haemoglobin, right? If we have four subunits of haemoglobin, surely if we have um, 
one binding, it increases the saturation of hemoglobin. As the next one binds, it increases the satur saturation even more. As the next one binds, it increases the saturation further. And as the, the fourth one binds, um, it increases the saturation further. 0% saturation to 100% saturation. Why isn't it straightforward like this? This is what we have to explain. Why does the curve show an S shape? This is what we're going to discuss right now. Okay, so again, we're going to have O2 saturation here, and again, we're going to have um, partial pressure of oxygen here. Okay, so why, why is it that it doesn't show a straight line as the first, second, third, and fourth molecules of oxygen are binding to each hemoglobin molecule? Why doesn't it show uh, a straight line like that? And it's all to do with oxygen binding each subunit and when that happens it induces a shape change it induces something called a conformational conformational change now I want you to be using terms like this but essentially it's a shape change in the protein, which it basically means it's a change in the tertiary structure. Let's see if that's some form. Uh, yep, that's fine. Okay. Right. So, shape change. So, the, when the first oxygen molecule binds the first subunit, that's a kind of unlikely event for one for, for a few reasons. Um, but the main reason is at low partial pressures of oxygen, we're waiting for, you know, what, what, does, what does essentially a low partial pressure of oxygen mean? It means that there's very few oxygen molecules around. Yeah? So, it might be, you know, the chances of an oxygen molecule binding that first subunit are quite low because we are still talking about, about very low partial pressures of oxygen. So instead of something like a straight line like this, we're looking at that because the chances, as the partial pressure of oxygen increases from very low levels, you know, there's only a very few oxygen molecules around and so the chances that one of them will diffuse and bind the first subunit are low, okay? Lower than um, what you might expect otherwise. All right, but when that first molecule of oxygen does bind the first subunit, it induces a conformational change. It, and and I, I'll show that in diagrammatic terms, like like this. So it induces a shape change in that subunit, and in the next subunit. Okay. Now what that means is that the next subunit has got a much better shape to be able to bind oxygen. It's more likely to bind oxygen, and the way we say that, it, that it, the second subunit now has a higher affinity for oxygen, okay? Now, I'm writing O2 there you've got to write the full word out. Higher affinity for oxygen. Okay, now what that means is that the, the second subunit has got a much um, better ability to bind with oxygen. Okay, so it, the, the rate of oxygen saturation for the second subunit as we increase the partial pressure of oxygen. Now there's two things here. First, the partial pressure of oxygen is increasing, so we've already got more oxygen molecules around. And the second thing is that not only that, but that second subunit has got a now much better shape. It's got a much higher affinity for oxygen binding. Okay, so that curve increases much more steeply. And this, when the second molecule binds that second subunit, it it makes the third subunit 
uh, undergo a conformational change. And now the third subunit also has an even higher affinity for finding oxygen, but as well as that, the partial pressure of oxygen has now increased even further. We've got loads of oxygen molecules around now in a particular volume, so that curve increases even more steeply. Okay? And this even increase, you know, when that third molecule binds, it induces another shape change again. So the fourth subunit has got a very high affinity for binding oxygen, but we've got a number of issues now. We've only got a limited number of hemoglobin molecules around, okay? As well as this, there's already lots of oxygen in the blood, yeah? We're reaching to, you know, very high levels, above 75% saturation. There's already lots of oxygen in the blood. It means that our uh, diffusion gradient is now not so great. So even though the, the fourth subunit has got a very high affinity, because we've got a limited number of hemoglobin molecules, there's only so high we're going to go, yeah? As we approach 100% saturation, we've already, we've already got lots of oxygen in the blood, so it makes the diffusion gradient slightly smaller, and th for that reason, the curve starts to level off as it approaches 100. Okay, so um, it's very difficult to ever reach 100% saturation of oxygen. You never actually reach it, that curve just keeps leveling, you know, just keeps approaching but never reaching that 100%. Okay, so as we get to very high partial pressures, loads of oxygen molecules in a particular area, we approach 100%, but it begins to level off because there's only so many hemoglobin molecules around, as well as that, our diffusion gradient is getting smaller. Okay, so. Um, this phenomenon is called cooperative binding, okay, and I don't think you need to refer to that specifically at this stage, but this is the reason why the, the oxygen binding or dissociation or saturation curve for hemoglobin is an S-shape, because every subunit doesn't have an equal chance of binding oxygen, with each molecule binding which with each molecule of oxygen binding, the next subunit has a higher chance. And so we get an exponential increase in oxygen binding rather than linear. Okay, right? But remember, that curve doesn't continue exponentially onwards. It starts to level off as soon as you start to reach very high partial pressures of oxygen. Okay, so that is essentially why that curve is S shaped for these reasons. Molecule of oxygen binding induces a conformational change that you do need to be able to mention. That conformational change induces a higher affinity for oxygen in the next subunit, which increases the affinity for oxygen and increases oxygen binding, but then begins to level off at very high partial pressures of oxygen. Okay, And for this reason, you can even it even helps to think of it in the other way. As you go, so we discussed going this way, but as you go from the lungs to the tissues, as soon as you lose the first oxygen molecule, the next one has then got a lower chance, lower affinity for oxygen. So, it, so the next one going backwards has got a lower affinity. When it loses that oxygen molecule, the next one's got even lower affinity. So it makes the opposite um, true as well. That as soon as you start losing one oxygen, the, the chances of losing your next oxygen are higher, the chances of you losing your next oxygen are higher, and so on. And therefore, as you go from the lungs to the tissues, you lose more and more oxygen, more likely to lose oxygen. Okay, and that's useful. Okay, because the tissues is where you want to let go of your oxygen. Sorry, dissociate. Yeah, okay, so now next we'll talk about the kind of different versions of hemoglobin that there are, adapted to perform slightly different functions and how that's displayed in, in, in different binding curves or dissociation curves. All right, guys? Now, we're gonna talk about different versions of hemoglobin. So, you know, just like you have um, 
different eye colors and that's um, encoded by different versions of you know similar same the same gene you can have different versions of hemoglobin you know different versions of that gene sequence different combinations of amino acids that give proteins with different functions sometimes different functions sometimes modified functions and this is what we're going to look at now okay so we've talked about hemoglobin and its binding or dissociation code is shown here with varying partial pressures of oxygen now there are different versions of hemoglobin because um, they are each adapted to perform slightly different functions now uh, one example we're going to look at is fetal hemoglobin okay now fetal hemoglobin has to perform a very important function right now in the placenta um, you know during the development of the fetus uh, it is important for the fetus to be able to get oxygen because it is also made of cells however it does not have its it does not have uh, its own lungs functioning that it can get oxygen from the environment so it has to derive its oxygen directly from the mother's blood or indirectly right so what we have is a kind of close associ association between um, the mother's circulation and the fetus's circulation. Okay, now this is happening in the placenta. Okay, I hope that is clear. Now, you've got hemoglobin, and what I'll, I'll do is call that hemoglobin um, O8, i.e. The, the, the mother's hemoglobin, so let's just label that mother, fetus, Okay. Now, how does the fetus get its oxygen? If the hemoglobin has got oxygen bound to it, how does the fetus get it? Right Now, one, one way that the fetus um, does this very efficiently is by having a different version of hemoglobin. All right? So let's just call that hemoglobin F. All right? Now, hemoglobin F shows because it's got a different um, amino acid you know different primary structure it's got a different protein structure and therefore it's got a slightly modified function than regular adult hemoglobin its oxygen saturation curve looks like this should I up oh, yeah, the okay its oxygen saturation curve looks like that What's the big deal about that? The big deal is this, that at the same partial pressure, at the same partial pressure, let's just say we're looking at this partial pressure. At the same partial pressure, where adult hemoglobin might likely be dissociating from oxygen, yeah, its percentage oxygen saturation is quite low. At that partial pressure, fetal hemoglobin has actually got a quite high saturation of oxygen. It's still got a quite high affinity for oxygen compared to adult hemoglobin at the same partial pressure. Okay, so let me do my key properly. That dotted line is fetal hemoglobin and that line is Hemoglobin, adult hemoglobin. All right. What does that mean? It means that where the mother's circulation comes close to the fetus's circulation, where the mother's uh, hemoglobin might be dissociating from its bound oxygen molecules, at that point, the fetus's hemoglobin will be able to bind that so that oxygen would diffuse out because they've dissociated saturation is low dissociation has occurred in adult hemoglobin but at that point the affinity for the fetal hemoglobin for oxygen is still quite high therefore any oxygen that dissociates from 
the adult hemoglobin can be bound by the fetal hemoglobin. Okay, so this all, all the fetal hemoglobin becomes O2 bound. Okay, now this wouldn't happen if the fetus had the same kind of hemoglobin because at the same partial pressures, um, the fetal hemoglobin would be also dissociating from the oxygen. So the fact that it's got a higher affinity at the same partial pressure for oxygen than adult hemoglobin means that when the mother's hemoglobin is dissociating from oxygen, the fetal hemoglobin can associate with it. And in that way, the fetus can then get some get oxygen from the mother's circulation. Okay? Right? Remember, this is happening in the placenta and it's not like the mother's blood goes directly to the fetus. You've got to understand that the circulatory systems are separate, so we're still relying on the diffusion of oxygen to get from one place to another. And the only way that the fetus is going to get any oxygen is by having a higher affinity for the oxygen at the same partial pressure. Okay? So that is fetal hemoglobin. And what that allows us to do is to see something um, very important, which is, if you've got a, an oxygen saturation curve of hemoglobin here, whenever you have a curve that's shifted to the left, to the left, it indicates that that has that hemoglobin, or the, the affinity, O2 affinity is increased. Okay? Now, guys, I need you to be using these terms, affinity, um, when you're referring to the binding of oxygen. I, I would rather you're, you're saying that the, the, the oxygen affinity is increased or decreased rather than um, the hemoglobin is better at binding oxygen or worse at binding oxygen. I would rather that you're using terms like this. Okay, so be careful of that. Right, so whenever you have the curves shifted that way, that means that the O2 affinity is increased. Now another example is a, a slightly different version of hemoglobin, which has got an even higher O2 affinity than the fetal hemoglobin. And this one is called myoglobin. Myo meaning muscle. It's a version of hemoglobin that is in muscle cells. Please don't start to think that muscle cells have their own kind of blood circulation. That's not the case. It's just a molecule very similar to one of the subunits of hemoglobin. It resides in the cells of the muscles. And because they have such a high affinity of oxygen, it allows the muscle cells to retain an oxygen reserve even when partial pressure of O2 is very low. So, you know, when, when there's intense exercise going on, muscles are con contracting a lot, they're using up a lot of ATP, and therefore they're using up uh, a lot of oxygen to generate more ATP to carry out the muscle contraction. In those situations when O2 partial pressure is really low, the muscle still retains an O2 reserve because they've got some myoglobin molecules with oxygen still bound, okay? So, you know, that's the reason why this myoglobin molecule, um, you know, serves the function that it does because it happens to have an extremely high affinity for oxygen as indicated by the curve of oxygen saturation very heavily shifting to the left, okay? Now, there'll be some situations where the curves are shifted to the right, and yes, you guessed it, that means that the O2 affinity has decreased. Whenever the curve shifts to the right, that means that there is a lower or a decreased of O2 affinity, oxygen affinity, which means at the same oxygen partial pressure, there's less binding of oxygen, okay? Lower affinity for oxygen, okay? So I think that covers hemoglobin and oxygen trans transport in the main
We're now going to discuss um, how hemoglobin and the blood transport oxygen because remember taking the blood to the tissues is just half of the story yeah taking oxygenated blood to the tissues is half of the story we then also need to talk about taking the deoxygenated blood and it'd be a great time to find my blue pen taking the deoxygenated blood you know back to the heart and lungs Okay, so that's the next part of the story that we're going to talk about.